You're watching Training Camp with Adam Marburger, exclusively on CBT News. Adam Marburger here, and you're in Training Camp, exclusively here on CBT News. It's a beautiful day to help a dealer enhance their F&I operations, and I've got a treat for you today. Today, I'm bringing on three very special guests. Not only are these individuals friends of mine, but they're massive com uh, contributors to their community and then the dealerships that they serve. So let's just kick it off with my guest here. We have Chris Saracino from the Kelly Automotive Group. We have Hello. Nikki Seeley from the Seeley Group up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And we have Rob Ruth of Bob Ruth Ford. Guys, thanks for coming in today and spending some time. I know you guys are extremely busy. I just can't thank you enough for coming in training camp with me today. Thanks, Adam. Our pleasure. So I have a, a statement. I know we're, we're similar in our thoughts. And training isn't something that we did. It's something that we must do. And I know lots of times I found in, in the past that, you know, growing up in the dealer world, sometimes dealers think that, you know, I'm going to send my guy or gal to F&I training. You know, maybe it was three or four years ago. They got certified and that's enough. Let me start with you, Rob. Let me ask you this question. How often do you think management should go some, through some type of formal training? Well, what does that look like for you and your organization? I think it's a it's a daily thing. I mean, I think you got to stay on top of your skills daily, repetitively, and to keep that discipline and to keep sharpening them, so to speak. So, I mean, that's part of our culture is training in all departments. Um, you know, I don't think it's a once and done. I don't think you've ever things are always changing, so we got to stay on top of things as well. Now, let me ask you this: I'll piggyback on that. How many people volunteer to train, and then how many people are voluntold that they have to train in your organization? Uh, you know, I think younger people are more, they want training more than when I grew up in the industry. I think the younger people are kind of, they expect it, they they want it. Um, I think you struggle with more experienced people that think that they know everything, but the younger people, they've grasped onto it in our organization. They love it. Yeah, and, and Mickey, I'm going to go to you real quick because servant leadership is extremely important. And I've had the honor and privilege uh, of being in your stores and the culture is just fantastic. Let me ask you this. When it comes to training and development, you know, what is your mindset on training? How often do you want to see your sales teams and your F&I teams and your executive management teams training? What does that look like within your organization and, and what measures do you have in place for your group? Yes, I would definitely agree with Rob and what he had stated as far as it being part of our daily culture. Um, it, at least that's what we're going for. Um, there, there's without question days that we fall off, but we're, we're trying to be intentional, uh, you know, in daily training. And that could be something as simple as is just making sure that we're covering one on ones. Um, you know, that, that could be considered a form of training. It, it, you know, I think a lot of times it's how you define it. A lot of, a lot of times people think that training has to be you know, flying your team out, out of town somewhere. Um, and it doesn't have to be extravagant that way. Um, but just a consistency of, of learning, um, being humble, being open to having conversations where you could potentially be wrong. Um, we're, we're trying to do that daily. Uh, obviously, we're tracking numbers daily. So we feel like we have opportunity to, uh, you know, talk about the things that are going well, why they're going well, uh, the areas that we're not, uh, performing the way that we'd like and, and, and why we feel like those things are happening and, and, and finding ways to train through just natural organic conversations daily. Um, but obviously more formally, it is nice to, you know, to, to try to find ways to train outside of just the daily, uh, you know, through a structure, through bringing people in. I think sometimes getting out of your normal environment is, is very beneficial. So we're, we're really focused on that as well, trying to find new environments, even something like this. I'm, I'm going to get a chance to talk to some dealers I've never met before today. Um, that's training for me. So training comes in a lot of different forms. Um, I think sometimes just how you, how you view it and uh, how you define it. Hey, man, that was well stated. Let me ask you this question too, Mickey, just quick piggyback. You know, we're leaders and we all run organizations and not every day is a great day. So when we get out of bed and maybe that day is just not a great day and we just don't feel like training, 
What is it that you do? You know you got to go in and lead an organization. But let's just say you're having kind of a, a rough morning. What do you do to put yourself in check so you can go deliver and pour into your people? If you don't mind sharing that, I think that could help other dealers. Yes, I think sometimes just recognizing what you said, it's like, okay, this is going to be more challenging today than, than other days. Um, and, and that's being real. That's, I'm going to say that's keeping it real. Uh, we, we all have those, those days where it's hard to find motivation. Um, you know, it, it's easy to fall off on, on consistency around certain things. And, um, you know, for me, it's just being honest about it. I, I, I have some people within the dealership that I can go to and talk about that. We try to have a, a uh, safe environment that way where we we try to find a few different people that uh, that we can share that information with where they're not going to beat us down more. They're going to bring us back up. Um, I've, I've got probably people that, you know, Stan Qual is our general manager. I can go to him, uh, Jake Norwood, our general sales manager. I can go to him, Ryan Steffler, our service director. Those would be my three that, that I would go to. And they, they come to me the same way. And, and then we just try to have it stack small victories. You know what I mean? Like in a situation like that, we're really trying to find victories, trying to get our headspace right, um, just starting there. But um, I think the biggest thing in the power in humility is being honest when things aren't going well and, and, and when you are struggling, because that's life. That's uh, everybody deals with it. Some people are better liars than others when it comes to that topic. But, um, you know, we, we we face it. We we don't deny it. We don't lie about it. And um, it, it is a grind, this business especially at our positions, being dealer operators. Um, and, and sometimes it can be too much. And so, you know, I've got my healthy habits that I try to stick to outside of work. Um, like, for example, this morning I was up at four something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in the gym early. Uh, I, I have to do those things to keep my headspace right when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Um, but yeah, just just being honest about it and having a, I'm going to call it wise counsel that you can go to to get your head back on track. Amen. I love it. So, Mr. Saracino, you know, mm -hmm. I, I got to ask you, you know, I've read your book. I don't know. I'm, I'm reading it now for the fourth time. I'm doing a study group. You know, that book has helped a lot of people. For those that don't know, uh, Chris is a best-selling author of The Theory of Five. Uh, that book has uh, made a, a massive impact in my personal life. But I want to know for you, Chris, because I know it's helped a lot of people in automotive. What was your real motivation? Like, you're, you're already running all these dealerships. You got a lot going on. You know, like what, what inspired you and what was the motivation to just put that book out into the market? And, and, and to piggyback off that too, there's a second piece. You're consistently getting that, you're, you're going back and re-editing this book and making it, enhancing it. So why did you write it? Why do you continue to enhance it? If you don't mind answering that, Chris. Well, I wrote the book. Um, I've talked about the theory of five um, since I'm 23 years old. And, and then when I became the vice president of the company, we talk about in our in our orientation, we talk about it. And then I, I think I shared with you before that I had some some um, tragedies in our life where we lost a son and a nephew uh, and some family members. And uh, my wife th went through a bout of cancer. And it, I had so many people in the past tell me that should be a book. And it was really more of my self-therapy. And the reason I just keep updating it is I sort of look at it, even though I've had people tell me, you don't update a book. It should stay the same. I look at it and say, uh, you know, everybody's life is never, it's always a grow, that growth mindset. And uh, I don't see me writing a lot of different books other than the version of the workbook. And I also have like a daily planner that's coming out, uh, but it's all going to be focused on the theory of five. And I just believe that there's a stage of your life where if you have specific knowledge and you know that it could support people in their personal and professional life. Uh, it's an obligation that you have to, to share it. I'm, I also want to share, you know, uh, what we do at our company for training. We are, we're very regimented. I mean, we're very regimented. We're very focused. We know that if we walk into any of the dealerships right now at 830, they're going to be reviewing red, yellow, green, which means where do they stand based on the forecast for that day? We know at nine o'clock that somebody leaves that meeting and they're going to do a sales training class and they have to give us they give us that plan for the month. What are they going to train? Who's going to train? And what's the topic? And we usually like you to stay on the same topic for a week because we're big believers that you can't just train something for a half hour and they know it. You want to just keep going over it until they really say to you, hey, you know, we know this. Okay, let's role play then. Show me that you know it. And we're very big in, uh, we do an orientation for every new team member that joins our company. We have close to 500 people. 
and myself or Greg Kelly or Tim Kelly, we teach it. We've done that for 25 years. We, we have a sales class, a Kelly sales class that we do. Uh, and that's every single month. And that's taught by a general manager of one of the stores. They have to rotate that because we believe when you teach it, you internalize it. And then you go, wait a second, we're really not doing this. Maybe this is really good. Maybe I should make sure people are actually doing this on a consistent basis. So we do that. And we also have, you know, we do an outside coach where we do some in-flight learning. So you understand sort of a disc and you understand who you are. So we have it. We have all our leaders. Has, they have to have a coach, which is Andrew Schultz, yeah. uh, who you've met. Yeah. Uh, he actually spends time with them, coaching them in their personal and professional life. Um, what they could do to have that growth mindset and first understanding who they are, because we're all different individuals and we all think differently. So we have to understand who we are and how other people think so that when you do your one-on-one -on -one coaching, because I've heard one-on-ones, the way we're going to coach, you know, you or Bob or, or, yeah, or uh, Mickey is going to be completely different because we're all, we're all different individuals and we need to get to know it, but we also have outside trainers. So we're very big. I wrote down, we have a trade cycle trainer that's been coming in for 25 years, a former half a car person comes in at least three times a year. We have Joni Stuker who focuses on referrals, owners, and prospects. And we just believe we owe that to them. And we would be hypocritical if we didn't do that. Uh, you know, we have uh, the one-on-one -on -one training. And then we also have on a consistent basis, we have every store has to choose an online sales trainer. We don't care who it is. As long as it's in alignment with the values of our company, each GM gets to choose, but then we monitor it and we say, and we look at it and say, this person's not using it. So we want to make sure what we, ins we inspect, what we expect, but the general manager chooses who they want. We just say, if they're going to use it now, show us that they're actually using it and going through the form. So I, I, I think we have to, as leaders have to have a paranoia of falling behind. And, you know, I have that fear that I don't want to be the old man sitting in a room and then putting their head down going, this guy doesn't even know what he's talking about. And I think you almost have to have that paranoia that you're going to fall behind and you have to have that consistent growth mindset because if, if we think we know it all, that's usually the beginning of being average and falling behind. And, and then you're a hypocrite. How do you ask other people to keep pushing yeah. if you're not pushing yourself? Yeah, amen. You, somebody, I don't remember who said it earlier, somebody used the word humility. I think being able to humble ourselves and to understand that there's always another level, there's always something I can learn, and I need to be able to reach out. And the accountability word, too, I think we can all agree that you know being held accountable uh, isn't the easiest thing. It's not the most comfortable thing, but it's the most critical thing for growth. And so, Rob, I, I got a question for you because you know I, I've watched you personally you know, just really grow your store. I mean, through the COVID era, you know, where you were shooting those videos out there and putting yourself out there. And then you built this incredible used car operation. And now I call it Disneyland. Disneyland's over. You know, we're, we're now back to really learning how to sell again. Margin compression is a real thing. So mm -hmm. right now in your operation, you know, how focused are you on F&I? And then also the relationship between F&I and your desk. Kind of what does that look like in your store? Because I've been talking a whole lot lately about how the sales desk is the architect and the f &I department is the finished carpenter, right? We have two different jobs, but we are very symbiotic and we're here to serve one another. So in your operation, since you've had some tremendous growth, what does that look like in your group with the relationship uh, between your desk and your f and department? Well, I think f and I is just crucial for all of us right now. Um, we came out of this low supply, high demand market and now, like you said, we're back into kind of how it's been for many, many years. It's kind of higher supply, lower demand, and margins are compressing. So can we control it? We can't control that margin compressing. We can't control what the market's going to do. But we got to keep volume going, which feeds all of our operations. And then we've got to focus on where we can survive, which would be, in, in my organization, at least, it's used cars, service, and F and I. That's what we have the most control over. So I think what you're saying is, I think it's the 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 biggest thing to focus on as a dealer is that relationship that the desk and and the finance department are all in one. Um, 
something we do, we try to make sure that we don't have compensation plans that people are working against each other. Because I've seen that and I hear that from a lot of dealers. I want everybody working towards the same goal. So we try to really align those things all together to promote that teamwork that we're all kind of shooting for the same, the same exact goals. You follow what I'm saying? Absolutely. Um, that relationship can always get better. I think that, you know, we're at a time that even, even our, even our salespeople need to learn more of, of the business, not just how to sell a car, learn more about the finance department, even with what the desk is doing, give them more knowledge that they can have more experience and they can influence their own destiny a little bit better as well. That, that was well stated. And, you know, I want to, I want to go diagonally back up, Chris, you know, you would, you would, uh, I made a statement earlier um, about training and how important training is. And in your organization, you know, and we're going back, you're the one who said earlier, you might be, you might have the most tenure on the call. You're the one who said it. So you've seen it all. Do you remember the days when the F and I department and the sales department, like they were like this? I mean, do you just remember that? I mean, it was, they just butted heads, right? And I think we've come a long way. I'm talking broad strokes here. I'm not talking about your organization. Just broadly speaking, there was a division between F&I and sales. Well, I've noticed that that gap is slowly bridging. And, we're, and these two departments are coming together, which is a beautiful sight to see. So let me ask you this. When you see uh, maybe a sales department and an F&I department that just aren't jiving, what are some best practices or techniques you as a former trainer, Chris? Because a lot of people may not know this about you, Chris. You're you're a former national sales trainer for Saturn, right? So, yeah, you know, before car dealer, you, sales process. you're a trainer, right? So, so whenever you've got divisions and departments that are that are not rowing in the same direction, what are some some techniques and best practices as a dealer that that you you can put in place or maybe help other dealers with? Uh, I'm going to hold a card up that we hand out all the time to our managers and remind it's never ending, and we've said this for 25 years over and over again. You know, team members do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. And uh, and then on the other side says people. So we are always reminding everybody uh, of, hey, people have to know how much you care about them. And you always have to explain why over and over again. And remember, you know, some of some people have amnesia. They get busy. They get excited. They forget about why they do things. Uh, but why we do it is because we care about people. And as soon as you really believe in your heart and soul, I'm here to support other people in making a great living and making sure they can take care of themselves and their family. And, and I just believe that once somebody joins our team, every, anybody's team, the obligation we have as leaders is to make sure they can support themselves and that they can make a great living and they can take care of their families. And then we have to explain this is why. We do this when you come to the desk, you're the air traffic controller. This is why we do certain things. This is why we have a business office that makes sure the financing is done. And if you keep telling them over and over again, and you know what the best part about this business? I had a manager get really upset a few months ago and he was, you know, pounded his fist and I walked up to him and I said, what's going on? Chris, you don't know how many times I have to tell people. I mean, I tell this guy over and over and over again. And my comment is, isn't this great? you're always going to have a job. You're always going to have a job in this business because a big part of our job is just reminding people every single day, you're going to say the same thing. So don't get upset with it. Just get a big smile on your face and say, wow, I'm always going to have a job and I'm going to go anywhere around the country I want because if I'm really good at what I do, somebody's going to hire me Amen. wherever I want to go. So it's, just, it's really just a mindset that we have to have when we become leaders and you start coaching other people. And, and, and then people see it by the way you treat them. Amen. Well stated. I want to, I want to talk to, uh, I want to talk about speed of transaction. Uh, it's a buzz. I hear when I talk to dealers, some of the pain points are, well, it's too long of a wait for F&I. My F&I manager takes too long. So Mickey, I'm going to pick on you for a minute, my friend. What is your expectation as a dealer principal on speed of transaction? So I'm the F&I manager, you know, Rob Ruth, uh, he's the desk guy. He hands me the deal. Hopefully, Rob, you didn't box me in too bad. I'm kidding. So how long should I have that customer in and out of the finance office completely signed and transacted? I just want to know what your uh, uh, perception on that is and your, your expectation. 
Yeah. Um, obviously, I think depending on what kind of market you're in and, and you know what kind of pace you're running, that it's going to change slightly. For us, um, you know, we're I'd say at my four store, which is where I'm I'm at right now as far as my home office. I, on an average day here, we're doing anywhere from like six to eight car deals. Um, and then if it's if it's a busy day where we're a little busier than normal, we're probably in that like you know anywhere in that ten to fifteen range. So. Um, some of it's going to depend on, on that, of course, right? It's going to depend on how busy you are and, and what you got going on that day. Um, I would say we we have an expectation for all customers, and we actually put this on our websites, depending on how much, you know, I'm going to say depending on how much information they're willing to give us and, and, um, and, and where they're at in the process, we feel like we should be able to deliver a car in an hour or less. Um, we, we feel like we're trained up and equipped to do it. In those situations where a customer is is asking for something like that, um, and so that that is the expectation as far as what the bar is here. Okay. Um, everybody knows it. I think sometimes just having the visual of it on our websites, where you know we're we're putting it out there a little bit, telling people, hey, you can expect this um, if this is something that you want to get done in, in that amount of time. Um, and so yeah, a lot a lot of it is continuing to remind the salespeople they're part of it as well. Um, and including them in the process of of all the stuff that you would expect me to say, but just making sure that that they're getting the right information the first time. Their paperwork's you know clean as a whistle. Um, we're holding them accountable to the things that, that they need to be doing right in order for that to happen. So um, yeah, we we're, we feel like at the moment they say yes, within an hour, anything outside of that would be too long. Um, we know what happens when it gets to be drawn out that way. Um, it, they're, they're buying less product. Um, they're not giving us as good a scores in the surveys. They're less likely to come back the next time. Um, we know that we're in a, we're in a time right now where the speed of the transaction is more important than ever. So I think it's a great question, Adam. We, we know how important, uh, how important people's time is to them. It used to be people would be at the dealership all day. I've been not doing this as long as Chris, but I've been doing it for 28 years. Um, and, and I can remember being on the sales floor, being a sales manager. You'd see people here all day. They don't want to do that anymore. Um, they, they, at least if, if most of the people that we're talking to, uh, it's, it's, not a fun, it's not a fun experience for them. So we're trying to get them out of here as fast as possible without shortcutting things and, and you know, shortcutting the process to make sure that we're still doing everything right and, and, and delivering them an experience where we're going to see them again. Yeah, I, I will tell you too, Mickey, well stated, a lot of it's too communication. I find that salespeople, if they're not trained properly, they can get a deal like that example where, where Rob hands me the deal and now I've got to go get with the customer. Well, sometimes the salesperson says, hey, you'll be, you'll be in finance in five minutes. Well, you're missing an insurance card. The driver's license is expired. There's things missing in the deal. It's You're not going to see me in five minutes. So a lot of that has to do too with you know, us training our sales staff to make sure they're saying the proper things because resetting the clock is critical. You know, one thing I do want to ask, um, I want to ask you, Rob, when you're looking at bringing on a new finance professional on your team, you know, what are some of the attributes, characteristics um, are you looking for in that role? Who are you looking? What is your perfect candidate for the F&I role in your, in your store? I think you have to have somebody that's detail oriented. If you're dealing with paperwork, they, they've got to be able to recognize the details. So that would be step one. Um, we've really been trying to promote people from within and just start training our salespeople while they're still selling cars, how to work the F&I department. So as we grow and it's time to bring somebody on, we already have them in place. So it's looking for those those attributes in the people that you already have and kind of planting that seed and and if they want it. And you're going to have to learn this job and also do this job that you're currently at. Um, obviously, somebody that's motivated, somebody that, you know, wants to better themselves, somebody that understands leadership. These are the things that we would we would be looking for for the F&I department. Would you ever let me let me ask you this uh uh, Rob, would you ever consider bringing somebody from the outside that's got no sales experience potentially in the future for that job? I think that, that that could potentially work as well. I think it's good to have career paths, though. I think it's great for us to have people within the organization and show them where, 
give them an opportunity to grow. I'd rather hire from within, but if I was going to hire somebody from the outside, it'd be great to hire somebody with no experience that we could teach them the way we want things to be done. You know, I, I brought us together. Uh, our time is, is running shy. I'm going to ask you guys another question here, but the reason I brought you guys together is because you all possess an insane level of personal growth. Uh, you guys are personal growth junkies, if I were to, you know, to call it like I see it. You guys are so consistent on becoming better versions of yourself. So let, let me ask you this question, Chris. I'll start with you. With you running a large organization, number one, how has your personal growth, A, impacted your management staff, and B, is your management staff adopting that same personal growth and trying to carry that torch through the group? Uh, the answer, I would say, as you were asking, I was thinking, uh, we have, of course, we have some people that absolutely just, they're bought into it. I mean, they're, they're so focused. They want to grow. They want more and more and more and more. And then you have some people that are giving you the hand uh, and you sort of have to drag them along and remind them over and over and over and over again. <laughs> Now, it doesn't change if you're six or 60. You know, we're sometimes all like kids and we have to remind people why you want to do it. And you got to let them know it's because we care about you. Uh, but we have some very talented people that, that want to stop. And I have to remind them that, well, things have changed. Let me tell you the changes I've seen over this industry. And it's going to change just as much over the next decade or two decades. So if you want to stay relevant, you have to have you know, that growth mindset. So it's, it's just constantly coaching. It's, it's never giving in. It's, you know, my mindset is it's no different than when you were raising children. It's either they're going to win and not make their bed and not do their homework, or you're going to win. So you just got to handle it with uh, kindness and caring and let them know over and over again. And once in a while, you have to, you know, put a line in the sand and say, this is part of being, you know, with our company. This is what we expect, the minimum expectations. Yeah, and, and Rob, I'm going to throw you kind of a curveball here. It's not too big of a curveball. I mean, we, we've we been through a lot uh, over the last four years, five years in this industry. What now that you've seen some crazy, and we're, I don't, I, we're, I guess we're out of the COVID crazy, but now we're into the margin compression, interest rate, high interest rate environment. God knows what's coming up, right? Where do you see F&I in, let's say, five and 10 years? You know, as a dealer, what trends and what does the future, in your opinion, look like out of that F&I department? I think it just, it, with everything that you just said, it becomes more and more important. We have, we can't stay in business without margin. And if we're facing margin compression, we're going to have to find other areas to get it. So I, I can't see that F&I isn't even more important five years from now than it already is today. And we just have to recognize that. And, and volume is going to solve a lot of those problems. Volume is going to solve our problems today. So we have to do volume. We have to fixed operations, F&I, used cars. These are the things we have to focus on. Amen to that. And then Mickey, I'll, 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 I'll end with you, my friend. So you, like I talked about earlier, you know, you have a, a really great culture. It seems like you've got really good buy-in. So what are some of the, you know, as you're, as you being the leader of the team, right, it all, it all starts here and it goes downhill. You know, with your personal development mindset, how do you share that within your group? Who's responsible to, a, to kind of hold that accountable? And what does that really look like in your organization? Because it seems like everybody's always in a good mood. And I know this, here's what I know. If you're consistently hiring, if you've got ads out in papers every single week and you're on social begging for employees, it's probably not them, it's probably you, right? And then your attrition rates are really high. So if you could share to, you know, a lot of dealers watch this show. So what can you share with other dealers a little bit about your attrition and then a little bit about the servant leadership? What are some things that dealers can do today that can help retain their F&I people and key management as a team collectively? Yeah, I'll say um, we keep really high standards here as far as our interview process when, when it comes to all positions. So, um we do, I'll, I'll say it this way. I mean, we do put people through the gauntlet. Um, you know, we, we've recently made some changes to our interview process. We're very intentional um, in, in how we hire. Um, we, we've had to learn some tough lessons over the years, but um, because our culture is so important to our success and, and we, and we know it is, uh, and, and we see, we see a lot of our success, uh, you know, come from customer service, and um, 
some of the tweaks that we've made internally here as far as compensation with our employees, like we believe they, they transfer to the other. Um, you know, it's one of those things where we're very, very intentional um, in, in who we're hiring. Um, we're, as, as you know, Adam, you've been here. Um, I'd say we're probably a little more youthful um, than, than most dealerships that I'm aware of. Um, not saying that good or bad with us and them, but um, we found that taking an approach of when we have an opportunity to hire somebody that has a resume per se, or has tons of experience, um, that doesn't stand out to us as much anymore um, as other factors that we're looking at. Um, not to say that we would eliminate somebody for those things, but um, we, we found that we've had more success with people with less experience who uh, have a mindset of coachability and, and who are willing to learn and who thrive under training like we're talking about right now, who who crave it, who, who just want more of it daily where they don't have all the answers. And so we've gone with a really youthful sales staff. Not that we would limit ourselves to that, of course. You know, we 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 would we would hire the right candidate. But for us, we found that we've we've had some really good success. Um and, and this could change, but right now uh, we feel like with less experience we're and, and some of the youth that we're hiring, uh, we're finding people who really want to be coached up, people who really thrive under the right leadership that we have here at this time, um, that that focus on consistent daily training, and, and, and they're listening differently, and they're actually executing differently, where uh, we've had some issues in the past um, with, and, and I think I, I heard somebody reference it earlier, it might have been Chris, um, just with some of the um, older, more veteran employees that, that uh, you know, feel like they know it all. And, and, and they've, they've gotten to a point in their career where they're uncoachable. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, we also have plenty of examples of employees that have been here a long time that, that have that same youthful energy that I just described. And, and to me, that's, that's euphoria, right? Like to me, that's any owner, dealer, operator, that's what we're going for. We're going for people that have the experience and the humility of wanting to learn more. When we can find that, um, those are the people that I'm trying to pass the baton to saying, hey, I want you to talk more. I want you to do training more and, and share with everybody, you know, what, what you've got going on. But um, we, a lot of intentionality, a lot of intentionality uh, behind making decisions. We, we understand it matters. Like, you know, there's nothing worse than, than high turnover. And um, we've done a pretty good job. Not, not a perfect job. We've done a pretty good job. I think of keeping employees happy through compensation plans, um, you know, through team culture things that, um, with some of the younger people, I think matter more than compensation sometimes. Um, just having a voice, being heard, um, feeling like they have opportunity uh, to grow in the company and also to what the company, what our vision mission statement is. A lot of the younger people we're finding is when they believe in that, there's instant buy-in and, and you can see that daily. Love it. I love it. Well, I'll say that uh, I'm grateful for the three of you guys to just come spend some time with me. You know, Mickey, Rob, Chris, I look up to all three of you a great deal. I, I really appreciate your time here. Uh, you shared some very valuable information. And, and the one thing I'm gonna say for the dealers watching this, the general managers, my F&I managers, my sales managers, commit to becoming a better version of yourself every single day, all right? We have to get out of our own way sometimes. Sometimes we have to humble ourselves. And sometimes we have to look in the mirror, and raise our hand saying, you know what? I don't know it all, but I sure as heck want to figure this out. If you consistently do that, you'll consistently climb. And it, by climbing to the top, that doesn't mean you're going alone. You should be lending a hand to bring several up with you. And that's what we do. And that's exactly who you three are. So I appreciate all three of you very, very much. Thank you for taking your time here today. Thank you for spending your time. And for the viewers, thank you for spending time in training camp because training is not something that we did. It's something that we must do and we must do it on a consistent basis. We'll see you next time in training camp exclusively hosted here on CBT News. Thanks for watching Training Camp with Adam Marburger exclusively on CBT News.